When is the last time you listened to a podcast about web development, web design, and small business and didn't fall asleep? Yes, we cover web development, web design, and small business, but like actual human beings with personalities. If you're a beginner, we're not going to talk over your head. It's more like asking your buddy for help. We have guests, we have fun, and let me tell you, these two can get off on a tangent. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to HTML All The Things Podcast. This is Matt Lawrence and Mike Curran. That's right, everybody. We are back in this episode 145, The Truth About No Code. I'm Matt, that's Mike, and this week we'll be talking about no code, the pros, the cons, the comparisons to actual developments, to like custom development, whatever you want to call it, the branding of no code, because no code's kind of like a mar- a market segment now. The whole thing, we're going to talk about it, we're going to talk about it in comparison to coding, so if you're a developer, you'll probably still be interested, and if you're a person that just wants to jump into something, you'll be definitely interested, so... If this sounds interesting to you and you want to support the show, you can go check us out on that Patreon. Leave a review or rating on your podcast app. Join us in our Discord server or share this with your friends. And now, our feature presentation. Don't go Alrighty. <laughs> we should have like a... Like, you know that, like, was it THX? The... Yep. That'd be great. Um, we already have like a super long intro, so I feel like that's not needed. But anyway... No code is a big piece of the web development world, and they give, quote unquote, regular consumers, basically people that aren't like techies or aren't developers, access to powerful tools that allow them to make websites, web apps, and even mobile apps. Now, these, again, quote unquote, regular consumers don't need anything more than a basic understanding of computers in most cases to take full advantage of these tools. Their power is not only valuable to these regular com- regular consumers, but to developers as well, which is why I think you will like this if you're a developer. Not only is no code often faster than custom code, it often needs less support, less patching, larger apps can be managed easier by, by a smaller, less experienced team. Now, if you're a developer, you might be rolling your eyes at the thought of this, like, oh, here comes the no code stuff. Here comes all this propaganda or whatever some people just if if you're a developer you might just hate no code but their value can't be ignored like like take a look at what i just listed there faster faster than custom code sometimes needs less support and patching right just to reiterate here and larger apps can be managed by smaller less experienced teams oftentimes this leads to a bunch of cost savings and can actually make it so that if your team isn't scaled yet but you're getting a bunch of clients and you just haven't spun up all your staff Maybe a no-code tool is exactly what will work for you in the interim. You might be able to build a full client project on a no-code tool without having to hire someone else, without you having to learn a new skill. Now, on a side note, and I do want to make I do want to make, make this clear that this is my opinion, but as a side note, I personally actually consider many of the tools that developers use to basically be no-code, not really the brand of no-code that we're that we're kind of talking about where it's like, "Hey, you're, you don't know anything about coding, go use these no-code tools. But, like, the tools that developers use are kind of like no-code. So what I mean by that is, it's not in the traditional sense of it being all consumerized or anything, but tools like Strapi and countless other plugins, right, they can handle things like photo light boxes, manage blog posts, handle user accounts, all that sort of stuff that you do over and over and over again. And there's many, many, many more plugins that do a bunch more. So if you really think of it, these tools, while inside of a developer's toolkit, they're really kind of designed like no-code tools in a way. They're designed to prevent the developer from having to code an aspect of their project. Now, these tools often have rough edges and things that require a fair bit of technical knowledge to install, set up, and use, but so does the thing that the tool does. If you're installing some rich text uh, element plugin so you don't have to deal with all the different uh writing codecs or care sets and all all that stuff you don't have to deal with all that and embedding images and transcoding video in line all that's whatever you know you did that because you didn't want to code that thing so anyway that's just an aside i just want i want to point that out now no code right to bring it back to basics here no code may seem like a dream come true right like i said faster development smaller teams less maintenance 
So why would you even bother coding at all? Right? It just sounds like, man, like, why are we doing all this stuff? Like, we just, like, who cares? It's sort of like, why are we using the, what's that, like, first calculator thing? The ab- abacus? Is that right? Why are we using this first calculator thing? Why don't you just use a scientific calculator? It's almost like this, like no code sounds in branding like the next step. The truth is that no code is amazing. It's really good. But it also has major drawbacks that keep developers working away at custom sites and the like. And keeps your eyes rolling if you're one of these people that are like, ugh, no code tools. Now, I want to dissect no code. I want to dissect them in terms of the traditional sort of way, pros and cons. But at a high level. So to be clear, I want to be talking, or I will be talking in general points. Not all of these apply to all no-code tools. Some no-code tools have these tr- have these problems. Some don't. Some of these have some of these have these pr- or some no-code tools. Excuse me, have these pros. Others don't, et cetera, et cetera. I'm talking at a high level, talking in generality. So if you're like, "Hey, you said that's a con, and my no-code tool already like has that fixed," I'm just talking in general. I haven't used all the no-code tools, not even close. So that's it. So, we're going to get started here, actually, with the pros. We'll do all the pros, and then we'll do the cons, because there's some of them that tap in directly to their pro counterpart. So, pros. Many of this is reiteration, but faster development with quick customizations. So, for example, templated sections, quick access to the, more, to the most popular settings. Like, you can sometimes just click, like, create blog, and there it goes. And more. There's a lot of the little intricacies like, hey, I want images to be a thumbnail done. It just does it. It just knows in general what the settings should be and it's just done. So it's just faster. It's just straight up faster than making making these things. And these tools are often actually designed right from the ground up with speedy creation in mind. So they want people to read that marketing site like, hey, our no code tool makes mobile apps. They don't want that person messing around with the header of their mobile app for like 19 hours. You can, you can fine tune it, do all you want. But what they want is they want speedy creation as in like, you literally click like, I want a nav bar with three buttons and it just sort of appears. And then the person moves on, right? You kind of get like your rough draft done really quickly. That's kind of what they want. So this fast development is a pro. Absolutely. And I actually want to point one thing out too. This isn't necessarily a mystery episode, but I wrote all these notes on my phone. So we're going to get Mike's opinion on these pros and cons live because I did not put them in our Google Drive where I normally do. I'm so going in Mike, blind. I'm going in blind. <laughs> you're going in blind. These are blind. Basically a mystery episode at this point. But these, these are these are just blind reactions, I guess you could say. So. Mike, what do you think about that first point there? Faster development with quick customizations. Yeah, I mean, I haven't used too, too many no-code tools, but um, in general, I've used Webflow. Uh, now that Matt has actually given me access to the HTML of things, I guess, beta site, uh, the site that's not yet live, uh, I'm able to go in there and actually start, you know, posting stuff. From a development perspective, I don't have too much experience, but from a user perspective, I'm just being able to do some minor changes here and there. It's very similar to full code tools, if that makes sense. Uh, like I, I've recently had a little bit of a stint with Statamic. It's a CMS that actually one of the friends of our show, David Lindahl, has recommended a few times. So I've just been kind of going in and poking around and helping out here and there with with the project on Statamic. And honestly, it gives me very similar vibes to how I felt with Webflow. So it has kind of the same workflow as just, a, let's say, a traditional CMS like WordPress, um, Satamic, like I was saying, even something like Sanity, which is a complete headless CMS, when I'm going in there as a publisher or when I'm going in there to edit stuff, it gives me those similar vibes, and it's very quick for sure. Uh, in terms of developing something with no-code tools, I think it, it's going to very much depend on what you're trying to do. If it's a blog, like a generic blog, and you have a really good idea of a template that you want – it's not only quick, it could be immediate. <laughs> like, I mean, bam, you have a generic blog. Yes, you have to change some titles and stuff like that, but that's the kind of stuff you would have to do even with code tools. Like, it could be something, you know, 100 times faster than a regular than regular tools. But obviously, and you'll talk about this probably in the, uh, the disadvantages or the cons list, it's going to very much vary if you have any sort of custom functionality. Like if you have some sort of a crazy date functionality that you need to, you know, do some sort of 
majiggering with like, you know, making sure that only these posts show up on these dates or something like that, like some, some crazy date functionality. As soon as you get into any sort of custom code, then the no code kind of goes out the window, right? And then you're getting in, yes, you can still add custom functionality, but now you're not using a no code functionality. You're using full code. Usually there's some tools that allow you to do some really cool, like pseudo programming, um, that I've seen before, but in, in general, it's still kind of, you know, you're still programming. Yeah. And, and actually that's going to be one of the cons, uh, and will be talked about in the pros and cons here, uh, as an ongoing thing, because you can obviously oftentimes tack on sort of custom code, like embedded or however the no code tool handles it, but it's a little bit weird sometimes. So we'll be talking about that in the pros and cons here, uh, here and there as we go through. So the second pro here is administration and support is often handled by the no code vendor. So for example, Webflow looks after its own hosting and fixes issues that arise. So you, as the person that, say, made the local used car lots website in Webflow, it's up, it's live, it's, but somehow the hosting goes down. I mean, you might get a, you might get contacted, which we'll talk about in the cons, but you might get contacted by that used car lot and say, hey, where's my site? And nine out of ten times, it's actually a Webflow issue and they're already working on it. Now, this also does occur in sort of normal hosting situations as well, where if you're kind of hosting on something like HostGator or something like that, if their server goes down, you know, they have to fix it. It's not like you're going to fly to their data center or walk to their data center, depending on how close you are, and then actually go in there and fix the server. That's not going to be what happens. They're going to fix it. So this is hit and miss. But when you start getting on a into- side note, it'd be pretty hilarious if you actually did, you know, fly to the, the <laughs> data center and just start smashing on the door. And so just start ripping server out servers. Server 2 is yeah. down. Yeah. Yeah. Server 2 is down. Yeah. yeah. So, what the hell is going on over here? So like, because it's a whole other different uh, department. It's usually like a, a data center team and it's usually like an, um, closer to an IT team. But the thing is, is that with a lot of these tools, you know, when something goes down and it comes back up, depending on the complexity of your site, the, the, other, the other parts of it, you know, will have trouble. So if you're having some really big advanced web app that runs on like Azure and let's just say all of Azure goes down and then comes back up. It's possible that your site will have some issues and those those issues won't really be handled by the Azure support. And I mean, I presume I haven't used it myself. But I presume you could probably ask them for help, but it's like your setup on Azure. So like they're more or less responsible for handling Azure. It's the same with just hosting. Actually, I should use because I've actually used this used this before where, you know, you go and you have trouble with your website some hosts like HostGator or whoever will will try to you know help you as much as they can but at the end of the day some hosts will just be like hey our web infrastructure is working our web server is working everything's good on our side uh we can't like we're not going to help you with your custom code but when with a no code tool i mean short of you embedding those little pieces of code they kind of handle everything so if like one time we had uh, an issue with the embedding tool in a rich text element in, in Webflow. I mean, that was really up to them. Like, I couldn't fix anything. You know, I could maybe help my user. And again, we'll talk about user support in a bit, but I could maybe help my user do a workaround. But you don't have like that stress of being like, holy crap, the site's down. Like, what do I do? Like, how do I fix this? Like, what's going on? And, and all that type of thing. Um, mm. I think, so I think that's that. a big, I think that's a big positive actually of no code tools, like getting rid of that cognitive burden of having to manage deployments, um, having to manage. And I think this is like the no code that we're talking about right now is more talking about like Wix, Squarespace and Webflow because they do handle the hosting for you and uh, the DNS stuff, all of that they handle for you. And that is a huge pain in the ass. It is absolutely like it, it's, you know, it's easy to learn and all that. Great. But even if you learn it, there's going to be some little cat gotchas, some little, you know, little things that you don't learn that are going to screw you up, screw you up a little bit. And when you have a service that not only handles the development side for you with the no code aspect, but the deployment side for you, you don't have to worry about a million different steps in between. Like when I was deploying the weekly growth calls application, it was like a lot of different spots. Like I had to deploy three different things, essentially. I had to deploy or two different things. I had to deploy the back end separately. So I deployed that on Heroku. I had to do, deploy the front end on Netlify. And those services are great and they're really easy to use, but I still had to look up how to use them. I still had to connect the DNS of my domain to them. Like there was just a bunch of things that I had to do just to get the site up. And I had to change the code even to make sure that it was compliant with how Heroku wants it, et cetera, et cetera. Like, I literally had to do a bunch of work. I spent like a whole day 
doing the deployment aspect. And I budgeted that and I knew it was going to be that. But regardless, that's how long it took. With something like Webflow, it's built in. Like you don't have to take a day to deploy it because technically as soon as you get it, it's deployed. It's on the site already. You just have to click like publish or whatever and that's it. So I think that's the that's one of the main pros of using a no-code tool, especially for someone that's just getting into coding or just needs just needs the tool for like, you know, starting a business or something. That's a that, that's a really good point is that it is it is a stressor point as well. And the thing is, is if you hire somebody like you're effectively hiring Webflow kind of if you're using Webflow and you're paying uh, for like the CMS plan or whatever. I mean, you're you're effectively you've hired a, an IT team for really like what is if you consider it a reasonable amount of money per month. Now, Webflow is rather expensive in comparison to other tools out there, like different hosts and stuff like that. But the thing is, is that if you have stuff where like your text just will not display and your users are using the the CMS correctly and you have you on your side have used the CMS correctly, you contact Webflow and, you know, effectively they have to fix it. You have an IT team there. And if you're a person that, you know, doesn't want to be working all the time, doesn't want to worry about those phone calls or whatever, or like is fine with picking up the phone, but doesn't want that stress of being in the position of, oh my God, what server's down? What is happening? Why is this database? Is this database corrupt? Do I have a backup? Like, what do I do? That those worries are effectively gone. Now, sure, you could say, yeah, but what if Webflow goes down? Yeah, but like, what if all the servers turn off in the world? You know, there's like, there's so many layers to support and, you know, you're well covered when you use a no-code tool that has a good support team, that has a good uh, amount of popularity is a really good one as well, is when when there's a lot of popularity, usually the company that's hosting the no-code tool will actually hire a lot of people or same with the host, you know, your host, like we had a major outage in one of our hosts a few months ago and it was a major outage. Like it was a couple of days where like things were intermittent, can't come and go, hit and miss. But the thing was, is that was the first time in something like six years that that happened and it was something they like d- divulged it. They said some sort of server went down or some sort of gate way went down and it was like the hardware so like the hardware was just that's it and so they needed to you know get some get another piece of hardware in there get someone to install it then configure it then test it make sure it works and all the rest of it and they were rerouting traffic around as they could to get it to be as intermittent as working as possible and then eventually that new part was put in like are you gonna be like are you gonna do that like as a web dev like do you know how to configure like gateways like people forget that you know yes you're on the internet but there is a lot there's a lot of stuff that IT, specifically networking IT, has to do to get the website to you. And a lot that the data center guys have to do. There's hardware, there's software, there's configurations. There's stuff you have to be compliant with if they have certain things like HIPAA compliance or whatever, and they're selling you different packages with different compliances. There's a lot that IT has to do. And so, yeah, you as a developer have a lot to do, but are you going to have enough time to do all the stuff that you got to do and all the stuff that you got to learn? and manage the data center and ma- like it's it's crazy this is why people go and buy hosting they don't just host it on their home computer because what if your power goes out like that that's a big question what if your computer dies well oh i need to get like four ram sticks because my ram went or something oh well what are you gonna do tell the client like oh it'll you know be like two weeks while i get like while i rma you know what i mean like it's it's just it's out of control so there's a lot that's handled by your hosting company and a lot that's handled by the no code company in most cases um Collaboration. So that's a big one. So collaboration is actually usually built in as a feature so your team can scale up as needed. So oftentimes you'll have it so that people will, uh, will let's say you're like a solo developer on, on Webflow and you start getting client, 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 client requests over and over and over again. You're like, holy crap, I can't handle this. Uh, you can, there's like collaboration tools built into these, these type of things. Like Webflow is a prime example. Obviously we'll keep coming back to Webflow because I'm using it so much these days, but, uh, Webflow is one of those those tools where like you can buy a team account and then start collaborating with people. And it's the same thing with it's the same thing with um, uh, what would you say? It's the same thing with like, uh, let's say like Google Docs, you know, something like that, where it's like it's just that simple, like collaborating on documents used to be a pain here. You know, send me the file. You know, oh, like give me the memory stick with the file on it, right? Back, even back further. Give me the memory stick with the file on it. It was a pain. And then like, oh, I'll add my part. I'll save it. Oh, the document's corrupted. Oh, it won't open in my version of Word. But something like Google Docs or Word Online or whatever has, cha- has changed the game in terms of being able to collaborate on a document. And in that same vein, a lot of these no-code tools actually use this sort of uh, mantra or whatever is the word I'm thinking of is like, they 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 say, oh, you know what? Like, let's make collaborating a part of this because if you're if you need to scale up, 
they want to be there with you because you're going to use more of their services. You're going to probably have to pay them more. And if it's easy to scale, you're now training more people in that tool. So yeah, even though it's a no-code tool, something like Webflow or something like Wix or something like Squarespace does take a bit to learn, right? Like you don't just know the iPhone interface if you've never used an iPhone, even though it's meant for consumers. It's the same with no-code tools. You have to learn it. So if you start training up people that know how to use Wix, know how to use Squarespace, know how to use Webflow, and then you get rid of them because, oh, you know, I only had them on contract. They were only supposed to do two sites for me. That person can take those skills, start their own business that makes Wix sites, makes Squarespace sites, Webflow sites, doesn't matter. They can go and just do that. And now that's another person in the market that's going to potentially be their client. So they love it. And so collaboration works both ways. Yeah. Uh, I think another thing with the collaboration aspect is that uh, it just, it makes it a little bit easier for onboarding new, new people into your project. So if you're, for instance, doing a food blog, let's say, and you, you're starting it yourself, but then you want to bring on another person, you, what you can do with like something like a, a full on collaboration suite is have that person watch you as you create your blog post and they can see kind of in real time how you create it. And that, that's something that like a no cool tool like that would do. Whereas with other tools, uh, you would maybe have to do that in like a Google doc or something totally doable. The other thing is, is that there are some, I guess, half code tools or whatever you want to call them. Uh, something like sanity.io actually just recently released full on collaboration inside their headless CMS. Uh, but to be fair, you can kind of say sanity.io is a no code tool because it al- essentially allows you to create a, you know, back end without having to write code. So it's the same, like in the same respect as how uh, Webflow would do it, you know, their their CMS editor, it's the same thing. So yeah, it, it makes sense. If you were if you were to create your own collaboration tool from scratch with like Node.js or Laravel or PHP, or whatever, um, yeah, that's going to be a huge pain. That's a huge amount of work. Like you're going to have to, you know, get to get going with WebSockets, make sure that your pipeline's good. Like it's going to be quite quite uh, work intensive to get collaboration going with pure you know javascript css html php whatever uh these these other tools i guess like a headless cms or a no code a full no code suite uh make that a lot easier and a lot faster absolutely and actually that this kind of goes this kind of goes hand in hand talking about half code tools and we already talked about this as well is that no code tools often can be extended by coding up some additional embeddable features. So something like in Webflow, you can put a little embed thing in there and write up your own thing. You can also add scripts to the beginning or end of the document. Uh, you can also add scripts on every page via like a custom code tab in the settings, stuff like that. And different different no code tools have different ways to handle this. And you can add your own code into it. So I mean, if you like get 90% of the way there and you need that little thing, chances are you will be able to do it in some capacity with a little bit of these custom code embeds or whatever your no code tool uses to handle it. Um, moving on to another co- another pro, sorry, here is uh, a great, it's, it's actually a great way. So no-code tool is a great way to start learning how projects are generally thrown together. And it's actually a really good starting point for, like, let's say if you want to start a side hustle or if you want to finish a client project quickly. If you have skill gaps and the client's like, hey, I really need you to do this quickly, you know, if a no-code tool can do it, boom, just go ahead, go ahead and do it. And actually, realistically, to bring it back to that sort of side note that I said earlier, that's kind of why some developers use plugins. Some people don't know security, so they use a pre-built authorization program, plugin, whatever it is to ensure that the user's credentials are secure. And so if they don't if they don't know security, which is almost its own field in and of its own right, they can just use that. So it's almost like that no-code tool for developers again. So you can fill your skill gaps. Like if you build a site and someone's like, I need a site and a mobile app, Cor- Cordova can fill the skill gap for you. It, now, it's, Cordova is not a no-code tool, but it's in that similar vein where I don't know how to build native iPhone apps. I don't know how to build Android apps, but I could take my site, convert it to an, a mobile app. Now the client's need is met and I didn't have to hire out. I My skill gap was filled and that's it. That's just the way it is. Or in the case of, let's say, Webflow or Wix, you know, this guy kept calling me. You know, he said I had six weeks to do this. Now I only got two. Well, I don't got time. I don't have time to do the custom, but I can maybe negotiate with him and say, you know what? I can get 90% of what you want. 
in two weeks, but it's only going to be 90% of what you want. You know, there's that little bit of, little bit of, uh, negotiation there, or maybe you can just reach that goal and just use a no code tool and do it more, do it more quickly. You know, just that's it. And so sometimes just, you can just use no code to your advantage. And if it isn't clear already, if you haven't been listening to the show, I'm an advocate of reaching for the tool that is perfect or that is most fitting to the job. Yes, scalability in mind and this and that, of course. But the thing is, is I have friends that will spin up like like huge enterprise routers in their house. Why? Like if you have a lot of servers in your house and you're a server admin and you're like playing with servers, yeah, go ahead, do it. Of course, have firewalls, this and that and the other thing. But then they ask me like, why don't you? Because I'm trained in that type of stuff. I can do some of that stuff. And why the heck would I? I go... I use the internet a lot. I go to the to the store. I buy a very good router that's three, four, five hundred dollars in that range, and I just hook it up, and that's it. I can do my changes that I need to, my port forwards and stuff. But I'm reaching for the tool that's good for the job. I don't have to take the hardest path, and that's kind of what I'm getting to getting at here. Is that a lot of people will almost find like, "Why well, I'm taking the harder path?" Like, is that a flex? Is that a Some, flex? Sometimes it is, I think. I think it is if if you're like if you're if, if it's for that purpose. So for example, if you're if you're a person that's like, you know, I can just click a button and like it'll generate this whole song for me. Like this AI algorithm will do the whole song for me. And let's say it's a super complex song, and then you you come in and you're like, you know what? I'm gonna do this on an actual guitar. And it's like it's considered impossible or very difficult, and you do it. That's kind of a flex, right? That's something like that. But if you're a person that's like, yeah, well, I spent six months more on all my client projects and res- and obtained the same result. Is that a flex? Like, is that a, is that good? Like, I don't, I don't think it is. You know, what, you know what I mean, though? Like, people will, people will seem to gravitate toward those that take the hard path. And I get it because they've done like more work. But sometimes it's like you're trying, like your goal is to get this project out for a client. Why did you take longer than you had to? And that's not me saying like always go no code, but it's it's I mean it's it's a question I have. Like it's it's serious. Like sometimes it's just like why did you do it that way then? Like oh, I, I spent all this extra time on this. Yeah, but if you obtained literally the same result, why? So uh, that that's just that's just my two cents on that. So like in, another thing is that a lot of people will kind of go against their clients personality or go against their client's wishes because they're more used to something or they're just uh they're trying to learn something whatever like for whatever reason like they they like to overcomplicate things maybe not that way but like they they like to use these set of tools even though it's not conducive to the client's way of working because if a client came to us or to me or to whatever and said that like he wants to be able to tinker with it. He wants to be able to learn about like the, the systems. They want to be able to like uh, change a lot in the site on their own. That to me immediately screams no code. You know what I mean? Like we've had that situation. In fact, that's exactly the situation that led us down the Webflow path is someone came to us and it was like, I really want to have a site that I can control as much as possible. Like they've used WordPress before. It wasn't up to their standards for what they wanted to accomplish. And like together, we like the whole team decided, hey, let's do no code. Let's do a Webflow as a no code tool. Yes, it's it's like it's still a ramp up, but it's a ramp up that's possible. So there is a lot in Webflow that's actually pretty complicated. And another kind of, I would say, positive of Webflow is that you can actually use it as a way to learn the basic, you know, layout layouts in HTML and CSS. It's a no code tool that's very much a visual programmer rather than a no code tool that's just like a drag and dropper. Um, there is some drag and drop, obviously, but most of it is a lot like you know, float or uh, flexbox and all the nomenclature that you would need to then take and transfer to a regular CSS document. So it's a really interesting kind of paradigm in 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 the web development in in the web development industry that kind of bridges that gap between maybe something like a Wix and a Squarespace and something like a square, uh, a WordPress. It's like it's somewhere in between more than anything. But again, back to the point where if a client comes to you and you can obviously see that they would benefit from a no-code experience, 
And A, like it would save them money. B, they would be able to manage it on their own and stuff like that. Yes, maybe that's not the best project for you. But in the end of the day, especially when you're starting out, you're trying to get word of mouth. You're trying to do as much as possible so that the client will recommend you and will have a good experience with with you as a web developer. So it doesn't matter what tool you use as long as you reach that end. Yeah, I mean, I mean, I think you summed up. I think you summed that up well. And the thing is, too, is is like to kind of go back to the point of, you know, you know, you're not going to go uh, or some people won't go with the flow with their customers. I mean, sometimes there's a reason for that. We had a couple clients that were like, or yeah, we had a couple clients that actually asked this. So where it was like, hey, like, I know you're working for me, but like, why don't you train me in your industry? And then I'll offer the same service <laughs> in the same area. And I was like, so you want me to train you as a competitor? Uh, no, I think. No, but you got to do it for free. That that was a thing, too, is like some people are just like some people will just say like, hey, like, I really need this. And I'm like, OK, yeah, well, OK, like, you know, $50 or I don't know, $100, $100 an hour. I don't know, whatever the heck it is. And they'll be like, well, I really need this. And I really need money. I mean, not to be blunt. Well, it is. No, uh, to be blunt, you know, yeah, to it's be like blunt. <laughs> to be blunt, like not to be a jerk, I guess is what I'm trying to say. I'm not trying to be like that capitalistic, you know, like screw you. But at the same time, it's like, OK. Uh, screw you uh, like, like, like <laughs> yeah like really like it's like effectively you know it's just sort of like i'm not like some things you're just not willing to do there's a line and you don't you don't literally say like f off to the person or whatever but you just sort of say like ah i'm not going to do that or hey we don't offer that like maybe go to this guy that'll maybe teach you or hey go to this youtube channel learn how to do it or like hey you're gonna have to like you're gonna have to uh pay me for the lessons or like whatever like there's just some things like that where you're just sort of like eh, like i i'm not willing to do that but like if you're willing to train them on how to use the wordpress editor like of course like go ahead that type of thing so it's just it's up to you like there is a line sometimes where you're the the customer i know that the 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 mantra i'm using that word a lot i don't even know if i'm using it right but the mantra is like hey like the customer is always right i mean ish (laughs) is my is is how i handle it so i'm like yeah like kind of you know uh so that's just that's just my thing um okay last last pro here and then on to the cons so um, if you're motivated by a project and not developing programming skills, then no code can get you started and even get you up and running for years to come. The barrier to entry is way lower and way less intense than learning to program, then chasing that project that may not work out. So if you're a person that really wants to go after a passive income initiative or you're a person that really wants to make a blog and you for some reason decide, you know what, I'm not going to use WordPress. I'm not going to use WordPress.com. I'm not going to use, you know, I'm not going to use any of this. I'm going to just straight up like learn to code. Like why? Like you're learning to code not for the sake that you want that skill. You're learning to code just for that project. Well, that project might not have legs. And if that project doesn't have legs, now you've just learned to code. And now like, like, what are you doing now? If you, if you have a goal to also learn to program, it makes a lot of sense. But a lot of people just want to start their own blog or they want to start their own whatever, some sort of side hustle, even a mobile app. Like I said, even a mobile app these days, there are no code tools to make mobile apps. So if you're a person that that really wants to make a mobile app, there are tools there and like go ahead and learn to code years later or months later. If you make that idea and it goes absolutely bonkers and you get millions and millions of hits or millions and millions of purchases of whatever the heck it is you're doing. And you decide, you know what? This is crazy. Like I need to, I need to continue to do this. Like I need to like scale this up. If you want to learn to code at that point, the idea has legs, go ahead or hire a dev team or whatever. But like there's, to me, it just doesn't make sense to go the whole way to like learn a whole field and then be like, ah, you know, that idea didn't work out. It's sort of like, well, all right, like that kind of was a waste of time. So that's kind of another pro of of no code tools. It can kind of get you started. Yeah. And another thing that I, I've noticed over the years is that no code has kind of gone into the space of like where WordPress used to be. So WordPress used to be for people that wanted to quickly get started without having to, you know, learn development and they would just get a template and start it up and then it would eventually get into the point where like the template was just a disaster and they could only do a very minor amount of things like and stuff like that so a lot of the times when my friends would come like talk to me and they'd be like hey how do I start my own site like I don't really have a lot of money I just want to have an idea and this is what I want to do 
Uh, before no code, maybe like five or maybe 10 years ago, before Squarespace and Wix really took off, I would always recommend them to WordPress. And there would be a lot of guides out there that would get them started at least. And maybe I could help them a little bit. Um, but for the most part, that's where I went. Nowadays, no code has gotten to the point where that's what I'm going to recommend. If you're just trying to get some, get an ID off the ground, like Matt was saying, no code is absolutely the place to be for that because it can do a lot. Like you could do e-commerce fully no code at this point. Like you don't need code for e-commerce. And if you need to get a quick site, like a Shopify site up, that, that is a no code experience uh, and start selling your product. You can do that in a matter of like, you know, a day or two to get all your products listed and stuff like that without having to do it, without having to pay in a full development team. Now, this is a development podcast, so people might be like worried about the fact that our, our field is going to be dominated by no code, which... which in some cases, yes. If you were if you were the kind of developer that was only doing business card sites and small little blog sites, like very small potato site stuff, like five hundred to a thousand dollars or something like that. Yes, what it the might heck is a potato site? Small potato, <laughs> small potatoes. Like I'm talking about, like you know, like just sites that aren't that big. Oh, they, oh, like their scale isn't – Yes, their okay. scale is small. Yeah, small potato. Any, anyway, so if you were doing one of those sites and that, that was your like, you know, forte and you were only doing those, then yes, potentially uh, this no-code movement could eat into some of your sales. But for the most part, anytime you start talking about larger projects and the projects where, you know, web developers actually can make decent decent income, those will not be able to be solved by no-code tools in the – in the near future, at least not in a good way. You know what I mean? Like it's always going to be a lot of compromise that you're going to have to do. And usually when a team has the budget and has the expert, like the expertise and has the leadership, they're going to turn to a development team. And you know what? In my opinion, it's going to lead to better jobs for developers rather than having to be stuck doing like really shitty websites that are kind of boring to do at all times. So I don't think it's a problem. I think it's actually a solution to a lot of problems where, you know, if a friend comes up to you and asks you to create them a site and you just don't have the time, you can easily recommend one of these no-code tools and they can get up and running and they'll be happy to use them. Yeah, that's a good that's a good way to put it too because as a as a person with a skill, you always have somebody coming to you and asking for help. And like whether you're a carpenter, you have people that are like, hey, I need new shelves put in or you're a web developer. Hey, I have an idea for a website. And sometimes, you know, they can you can point them to something that they can help themselves. So you don't if they don't have a thousand dollars or they don't have fifteen hundred dollars or they don't have they don't want to pay you and you don't have the time to help them and you don't want to help them, then you can just say, hey, man, like you're like, here, like, here's your help. Go here, go here, go here. Check out this YouTube channel away with you. <laughs> you know, you have helped. Like, here you go. Help yourself now. And a lot of the time they won't know about that type of stuff. Because they'll come to you before they even look into it. And then that's it. And like sometimes people will just be like, hey, thanks. Boom. That's it. And you've just helped them. And that's the end of it there. So that's a good way to put it. Uh, on to the cons now. Every time I say cons, I always think of like con from Star, Star Trek. Trek. Yeah. Con. Just... Con. <laughs> um, I there is a scene. I remember this is like a really random tangent, but I remember I like one day I was just like, you know what? That's it. And typical me and i decided i was just gonna watch star trek the original series and i did the whole thing and uh minus like two of the movies i think but anyway so i watched the whole series whole series including the animated series don't watch that um i really there's one episode in there that like it's the second worst piece of media i've ever watched the rest of the whole animated series is actually okay but there's a there's an episode in there where i can't believe it aired like i just i can't i can't believe it and i just Anyway, I'm not going to get into it because we're going to have a whole podcast about that one episode. I just it's incredible how much I didn't like that episode. It's just like, wow, bad writing and bad animation. Good. <laughs> and it didn't make sense. Good. So uh, anyway, we're not going to we're not going to go there anyway. But the rest of the show is, is fine. Go ahead and watch the rest of the animated Star Trek original series animated series. But anyway, um, I forget what the original point was I was going to make. But anyway, apparently I watched that. that There's my tangent because I forget the point. Uh, that I, oh, I remember the point. Do you remember the episode, Mike? Did you watch that series? You watched it, right? The original Star Trek series? Yeah. Uh, you know what? I recently started rewatching it again, and I stopped after like the third episode, I think. So Okay, so I don't know how yeah. early it is. Maybe you did see this, because I think it's relatively early. Did you see the episode in which, and this is a spoiler, um, for when Kirk gets split in the transporter? Yeah. So when he like 
it's like he has his like positive. Mo- it's not like evil and good. It's like his positive motivation and his negative motivation. So it's like the piece of him that would, you know, like all of us, if you have like a thought about something, you'll have like a really pessimistic or an evil thought. Like all of us like process thoughts in like good, p- good, bad, whatever, all the rest of it. So like his like unmotivated, angry part or something was made. And like then that like. So that was one Kirk. And then another Kirk was like all his positive motivation. But like your mind needs both, I guess, is what the show was trying to say. And I watched that one scene where he like walks around screaming, I've Captain Kirk. I've Cap-! That that one. You remember that one? Yeah, that's I a famous one. Yep. Yep. I was on the floor and I kept like I found it on YouTube so I could watch it quickly for like a week. I was on the floor laughing. So that's uh. Yeah, that's one of those videos for me. <laughs> it's, oh man, it's so good. It's just, it, oh man. Anyway, that's a really random tangent, but, uh, but yeah, go watch the, go watch Stargate, Stargate. Yeah, go watch that too. Okay, uh, back to the cons here. Support and administration. Now, I know that, I know I said that this was actually a pro, but again, I'm going to tie in some of the pros with the cons. While this is typically handled, by the no code vendor. And when I say no code vendor, I'm going to use that a few times in this con section. I'm talking about the person that made it. So like Webflow, Squarespace, Wix, the company basically. So support and administration is mostly typically handled by the no code vendor, but it still has to be handled somewhat by the creator. And if you're not versed in support, interactions can be clumsy with your customers. So for example, customer calls you and says, hey, how do I log into this editor? You kind of got to be ready for those type of questions, whether you have a knowledge center that written up and you can send them a link or whether you know where to send them the link to or whether you know how to help them. You just got to kind of be ready for those type of support things because those type of things, you know, I guess you could pass it on to Webflow or could pass it on to whoever, but you're not going to. So that's just be ready. Basically, that's one of the cons is that it's easy to overlook those type of questions. And then you're just like, oh, crap, I actually don't know. And I'm like not at a computer. Like, I don't know where that link is. So you might want to be prepared with making your making. uh, So like a a prime example is we had a customer that goes went on to a uh, an email service and they just couldn't or like I just couldn't remember where this link was to their email settings. I just couldn't remember. And so I was like, you know what? I keep sending them email after email after email with the thing like I keep remembering or keep reminding them. And when they ask, hey, what are my email settings for an email client? And this information was already public you know, short of their usernames and their passwords, I was like, well, why don't I just make a web page on our website and then just give them this web page? Cause this, all this information is public anyway. It's on the vendor's site, but I just can never remember the, the vendor's link. I'll make it a real easy to remember link for myself. I'll bookmark it, whatever. And then whenever they ask a question, I can just copy the link, send it to them in an email. And it's just much, much quicker. And I can add, add and edit details right there. So that if they're a person that's like more independent and they won't, they won't ask me, they'll bookmark it themselves then they can just refer to that and get the most up-to-date information. So that's exactly what I did, and it worked out immensely well. So just like a little tidbit there. Um, next, next con here. Scalability has its limits preset. So for example, if you have the highest, or if you have a uh, Kanoko tool that has the highest plan, like the gold plan or whatever, and it says you can only have 1 million monthly visits, then that's it. That's it. It's over. Now, unless you can go into an enterprise plan and broker a deal with the vendor, that's it, man. So it's not like Azure where you can just keep growing and growing and growing. And yes, there's a physical limitation of everything, but you're not going to overtake every server in the world. You're not going to overtake Azure (laughs) Uh, or chances are you won't. So if you if you expect big numbers like that or you start getting close to that, you might have to just leave that no code tool altogether, which may cause you to have to build out a whole thing. But. I mean, if you're in a niche and you're just sort of like, I got like 400 members on my membership site. I mean, you're not going to hit your one monthly visits probably. So just something to keep in mind. That scalability is preset. Arguably for most people, they're not going to hit those monthly limits. Like if you're you're building an app that's meant to hit millions of people, then you better have a budget of like millions (laughs) of dollars for the marketing to get those millions of people. This is where like a lot of these like half-baked ideas always fall apart for me. I get a lot of pitches coming my way from friends, from random people on the internet, from like coworkers and stuff like that. They're like, why don't we make like a social media site? Why don't we make like a a, a really easy to use some sort of application that everyone's going to use? And I'm always like, okay, great idea. You can make it the best ever. Like you can make a site that's 10 times better than Facebook. 
not even that hard, honestly, because Facebook is like not that great. Like it doesn't do anything that well. It's like but it's you, like it's like filling forms. Like ninety percent of it is like a bunch of forms that then display the contents on exactly. the Exactly. Like it's really not that hard to make a Facebook. How the hell are you gonna get people to use it? Well, they'll, they'll see that they like it and who? Who's gonna see that yeah, they who, like who's it? Who's gonna see it? Yeah. yeah how what do you are get you talking about? People? Like <laughs> How are you going to do it? How do you think these other sites did it? They spent millions upon millions upon millions of dollars to get people on there. They gave away stuff for free, all that, et cetera, et cetera, to get people to use it in adoption. If you build something great and you have millions of dollars, sure, you're going to get the scale. If you're building something that's going to grow organically, you're probably not going to worry about scaling anytime soon. Like it's just it like it's just not not a thing you should worry about. It's it's one of the, the the final things. As long as you're not like, you know, building for a Fortune 500 company with millions of dollars. That's all I wanted to say on that. Yeah, like if you have a surefire idea, and like I mean, God knows how you would know what's surefire. But if you had an actual surefire idea, and you know, you know what, this is made for these five corporations, and there's going to be over a million people using it, and this thing has a limit. This no code tool has a limit of 1.5 million. Okay, maybe you're okay. A little bit of scale there, whatever. It's up to you, depending on your numbers. But if it has a million limitation, hmm, like maybe no, don't do that. And maybe like actually hire somebody to do something. It just, it really does come down to like you making the proper decision. But the thing that sucks with no code is that scalability is preset. So that's one thing. Because the thing is with with scalability in, in normal hosting, you know, you'll have Issues where, hey, you know, the, the site's slow. Hey, you know, the site went down because we hit our the uh, maximum size. Like we had 10 gigs of web web space or whatever, and we used it all. And now we need more and whatever. Like there's always like issues like that. And the thing is, is like with a lot of hosts, there's limits set too. If you just talk about not a no-code tool, but just a host. Oh, I'm on shared hosting. Well, shared hosting has unlimited, but like there's an agreement there that says I can't use way more than everybody else due to fair use. And if I don't have, if I don't like, uh, abide by this fair use policy, meaning like if everyone on the site, if anyone on the site's using 100 gig and you're using 200, eh, like you might get flagged and they might be like, hey, you're using more than everyone else in this shared pool. You need to use less. There's stuff like that out there. And so that's kind of like a roughly set scale. But then you can also talk to them and say, hey, you got most most hosting people will say, hey, you got a uh, you got dedicated somewhere. Oh, yeah, we got dedicated. OK, upgrade me to dedicated and they might handle it for you. So there's like there's definitely like predefined scalability. Uh, scalability is also a huge part of like cloud computing. So you could like buy a scalable thing where it's like I'll just pay for how much I use per minute, per second, per whatever, per day, whatever it is, and then you can go with that. So it's just with with no code, it's just very very cut and dry. Million hits, that's it. You know then 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 what happens? Who knows? Like I don't know if the site would shut off or whether they would tell you, hey, you've outgrown us. I don't know. I've never actually seen anyone outgrow a platform like that but i do know that pat uh, the passive income podcast smart passive income podcast of pat flynn i remember him mentioning in passing one time so i don't know the full story but he used to use bluehost for one of his sites so i think it was maybe his main site and then he he said he outgrew it so i presume he like outgrew the bluehost now whether he still uses their dedicated if they have that i don't use bluehost i don't know but like even even stuff that's like not as no code as what we're talking about does have scalable limits but no code is pretty set in stone unless you can negotiate with the vendor uh okay next one next con here is um feature limitations are also set so for example if you want to make a webflow membership site and you do not want to use third-party plugins or services like you just want to train your staff in webflow you're out of luck done you're already done uh there's like a third-party plugin or third-party service or something that i saw once never used it that says that they can you know, make your Webflow site a membership site. And there's obviously ways to like plug it into it and all the rest of it. But if you're a person that just says like, hey, we want to be in the Webflow ecosystem and that is it, you're done. You're already done. Uh, you just can't do it. So there's those hard set, like I said already before, the scalability has those limits. And now your features are also limited. Whereas if you're making something custom, you're limited only by your skills. And even then you could hire someone to make that, I don't know, that transcoding app or something and then your videos will run better or whatever so that's another limitation that's what these here's here's where no code starts falling apart it's the when you start bumping up against these walls you kind of start getting into problems now another con here very small details uh can often uh not be changed so many no code tools have customization of course they do a lot of it but not infinitely customizable 
So, you know, you could, if you wanted to, I don't know why you would do this, but you could make your button on your site one by one pixel. <laughs> you could in custom code, but in a lot of no code, it'll say like buttons must be 50 pixels wide or something. Not all of them, but some of them would. And then you just can't do that for some reason. Now, why again, why you would do that, I don't know. Maybe you can't use pseudo classes. Maybe you can't use certain like really niche like CSS properties or something like that. Maybe there's something like that. But the point of the matter is, is there again, there's those limitations. You're bumping up against these walls. That's kind of the trend in the cons of of uh, no code tools is you're you're kind of in that walled garden, I guess you could kind of say if you bring it to the Apple sphere it is really that you're kind of you're in that walled garden. And you can't. In this case, you can't leave or you've been bumping up against the walls here. Now, no code can be difficult to extend with custom code. Now, I know in the pros, I mentioned, hey, you can extend with custom code. So you might be saying with all my other feature limitations, you might be saying like, hey, but yeah, but like I know how to code and like I can add all these things. You're you're right. Kind of. You can extend stuff with custom code. But here's the thing, because your custom code can be anything. The no code platform isn't necessarily going to be compatible. So here's the thing. If the no code platform has a blog plugin just built right in blog template, you click blog, that blog template is built for that platform, built for that platform It's built for that platform CMS. It's ready to go, ready to go. But if you're if you're starting to embed custom code, they don't prepare for your custom code because they don't know what your custom code is going to be. So your custom code might work in a in a browser, vanilla browser, like just regular every day. You put it in an HTML, like you made it all custom and you put it in your JavaScript might work perfect, but your JavaScript might not work in that in that no code tool. So you might be stuck with a not having the feature that you want or B, you might have to do some workarounds and kind of massage it, as some people would say, to try to get it working. You might have some of that. And Mike and I actually have already experienced that a couple of times in Webflow. Just some things where it's like, damn, we can't do this. And it just, you know, hey, there's a workaround here. You know, we'll apply that in a future version of the site or like as we as we slowly uh, evolve it. That's one thing that we'll plug in from a third party source or whatever. But that's definitely something to, to keep in mind is that even if the no code tool says like, hey, extend your code with custom code, that's correct. But it's very possible, not guaranteed, but very possible that there will be limitations in that. And I'd like to point out that it oftentimes is coding in line or coding in like a little uh, window. And so it's not as like efficient as like, say, coding in like a VS code or something. So it can get a little bit annoying because it's like, oh, I have to save my code. I have to close this window and then I have to press publish to test it. OK, now I got to reopen the window to see it again. Like it's not usually as flushed out because the ability to have custom code is an add on because it's a no code like thing. It's a no code platform. And so custom code is just an add on. It's not the focus. Yeah. So just absolutely. just something to keep in mind. It feels like an afterthought afterthought a lot of the times. Absolutely. That That's exactly it. And and to be honest, like we see this actually even with something like WordPress, you know, WordPress is used by developers because people make their own templates and this and that. But if you're a person that wants to really edit a bunch of the stuff from the WordPress editor or like like I know that there will be some people out there that will use a tool, let's say it's WordPress. And they decide that they want to use that tool to the max. They don't want to add any redundant features. So you do, they want to use like the new uh, WordPress like block editor or whatever they call it, like they where they can where web where WordPress is slowly kind of becoming its own page builder. Um, instead of using like third party, they'll try to use WordPress vanilla as much as it can. And then they hit that wall and then they, you know, make their own plugin or they install another plugin to like add the functionality. Here's the thing is that sometimes it's just it's. Like the fix is just like a small bit of CSS and you kind of have to dig through the menus to add the CSS. Is it easy? Yeah, you can add custom CSS really easy in WordPress, but it's in a couple of menus. So if you're new to WordPress, you don't know where that is. And again, if it's a lot of CSS that you have to add, it's kind of cumbersome to code in that little tiny window. So it because WordPress is there to be a package, like a complete package, not a no code package necessarily, although it can be. But. It's not there to be a coding tool, if that makes sense. It's it's meant to be like a coding companion ish. Like WordPress changes as as you install plugins. It can become this all inclusive, really easy to make pages thing, or it can become just a companion to your development, where you just want all the blogging features of WordPress, 
but you're going to make a site custom all around it and then plug it into WordPress. So then you coded it, right? So WordPress is sort of malleable like that. But in terms of making it a no-code tool, having access to those little embedded things is nice, but it's kind of like annoying. (laughs) It's kind of annoying. And I noticed that some plugins will be like, oh, make your own CSS style sheets or something. So then you go and you make your own CSS style sheet. But then there's also the custom CSS part of WordPress where you're able to add that yourself. So then if two different developers go in and they're just sort of like, oh, I'll just add some CSS. Now you might have conflicting CSS in this random other plugin that the other developer doesn't even know exists. And it's like this. Now there's like two areas to have custom code and they're like conflicting. And it's a whole like definitely uh, we've definitely seen it. And there's definitely been problems like that in the past. And so it's just it's just one of those things. It's just one of those things. Yeah. The, the other thing with uh, coding inside of like a no code tool is that it's really not conducive to learning as a new developer. Like if you're a new developer that decided, hey, I j- I'm just going to use a no code tool and then I'll learn on top of that, um, like how to do JavaScript or something. It's going to be a little bit more difficult for you to do that rather than just like, you know, coding in a regular IDE or coding in just starting a site from scratch. It's just it, it's because of the cognitive like thinking of how the editor works it's going to be different for you than for the person that developed that no code tool. Like they have a they have a system in mind and it's very complex usually because they have to adapt to so many different ways that it can be done. So there's like a million built-in systems that they're using. So when you're trying to extend those systems, you actually have to plug into what they already have created. So you have to learn all of those, like not all, but a lot of that infrastructure that they've already done to be able to then extend it. This is more for building like a plugin on top of a system rather than for just doing like a very, like a simple, like, you know, JS inline, whatever. But regardless, if that's your kind of path and that's what you're thinking, I just wanted to get that out there that it's not going to be the best way to do it, in my opinion. Like if you're just going to be diving into creating Webflow plugins, or I don't even know if they have a plugin infrastructure or like Wix plugins or whatever, it's just like you're going to have to learn not only the coding aspect, but the actual how they manage their file structure, their infrastructure, how they plug into all their inbuilt in features and how you're going to plug into that. So it's a whole overhead that you wouldn't have to learn if you were just like, you know, having an HTML, CSS and JavaScript file. Yeah, uh, I mean, and that that actually ends all my uh, all my cons as well. Um, cool. Yeah. I mean, I think we've uh, basically encompassed no code. I'm sure we'll talk about it way more as we as we go, as we try new no code tools and stuff like that. But uh, I mean, I think we've uh, completely uh, beat it up today, or at least anything that I wanted to cover. And uh, I mean, I think it's on to the weekly weekly growth goals, Mike, to be honest. Um, What do you what do you do and what's your status on the weekly growth goals? Now, I will say one thing is that we're doing episodes and I said this in the previous episode is that we're doing episodes so that we have a week of lead time now. And so we've like, (laughs) like reset now. So we're just, we'll just be like going through our weekly growth goals, but we'll probably end up being like a week behind you guys. If you guys are sort of following along with your own goals, but we'll still have like a goal every week and a, uh, a goal every week and a new goal the next week and all the rest of it. But it's just a matter of we're like a week behind now, but like, I mean, short of you hearing this, it's kind of invisible to the user. So yeah, not only that, you can actually check what we're doing on the weeklygrowthgoals.com app and then you'll be like in sync with us. So if you're curious what we're up to a week ahead of time, just check out that app and you can participate yourself and put your own weekly growth goals in there and stuff like that. And then this is my like weekly reminder to get Matt to use the app because he's been, (laughs) he's not using it. So uh, Matt, use the goddamn app, please and thank you. Uh, (laughs) Jesus, Murphy, you hear the language on this this man. (laughs) So that everyone can see what you're doing. Uh, So yeah, uh, my last week's weekly growth goal was uh, doing like just really interacting with Twitter. So I decided that I'm going to follow this new strategy that I heard about. It's eight, do at least eight posts on different people's Twitter, like comments, eight comments on different people's Twitter accounts a day, and then post like at least one of your own original ones. So the one original one is actually not as important, but I have been doing that at least. And I've been actually doing way more than eight, I would say. I've been, I've been posting all over the place on Twitter. So 
Uh, that's something for everyone to look out on. If you haven't started following us on Twitter, we're at HTML everything on Twitter. It would be awesome if you could follow there. I'm going to be trying to provide some value content on the daily basis, whether that be like some code pens or some uh, interesting things that I found or just some musings of my own. So you can definitely check us out there. Uh, but I am going to be interacting heavily with the community. So if you're already on Twitter and you have a com- established community, uh, just let me know. Like, let's connect and we can kind of do some collaboration or something like that. Uh, but for next week's weekly growth goal, I think I'm going to go in a little bit of a different direction. And um, I think I'm going to do a blog post for next week's weekly growth goal. So I have done like a few extra blog posts over the last month or so. So I kind of want to continue that trend and just really get a lot more content out there, especially because we have the HTML of things website coming out anytime now, really. Uh, it could potentially be out when this episode is out. I doubt it, but it's possible. Uh, all we're all we're really doing now is filling it with content. So I feel like that's probably a good thing to do is actually provide a piece of content. Yeah. Yeah, cool, because we actually had a lengthy discussion actually before this show talking about sort of long term plans. I have some cool uh, we have some cool ideas uh, for sort of like I want like an overarching uh, goal for the site's content. And I, I want to get away from just the simple, but we'll still do this type of stuff. But I want to get away from the sort of, quote unquote, simple or stereotypical, maybe, or whatever, templated sort of top 10 ways to, you know, we'll obviously still do those type of things, but because they are valuable. But we uh, there are some cool sort of things that we want to distinguish ourselves with. And we also, as you know, as a little bit of a teaser, have some uh, different educational background than just web development. So we're going to try to tie in some of those skills and uh, knock the old rust off those college skills and see if we can't come up with something cool that uh, marries web and these other skills, which I'm like I said, just a tease. I'm not gonna let you know because we don't even know if we're going to do it. But uh, my weekly growth goal was to figure out the Google ads and figure out the Amazon affiliates. Uh, I ended up doing the Google ads. They're ready to go and I can embed them they're working that's it i haven't embedded them yet but like just wanted to get the account sorted that is sorted the amazon affiliates uh i did not do and the reason why i did not do that is because i decided to do a little bit actually more work on the html all the things website because i don't think we'll be using affiliate links quite yet we may i don't know yet and because that was a question mark but google ads are not i decided to go after anything that's going to expediently launch the site so I'm actually going to go in the same vein as Mike this week, and I'm going to say I'm going to do content management. So whether that be add a piece of content, fix up how the content's displayed, because some of it's a little bit, I do kind of want to change it on how uh, how it looks on certain screen sizes and stuff like that. So I'm going to do content management. Now that the content's in there and we don't just have all the, all the lorem ipsums and stuff, stuff like that, I'm, at, I'm able to see the real world result of what I've done. And I'm able to tweak it. So that's where I'm at. Either I'm adding adding to the content, editing how the content looks, do that type of stuff because the the, the site is effectively done. We just need to fill it up and we are. So it's not like we're, we're slacking. So the site will be out soon, possibly at, at the time that you're listening to this, possibly not, or even out piecemeal, who knows. But that's, uh, that's where we're at. Weekly growth goal is, you know, semi-complete because it kind of got changed in the middle. But uh, but yeah, the bulk of it's done. So that's uh that's it for my uh my weekly growth goals po- post that there on the weekly growth goals app please <sighs> damn it i knew I, you were gonna say i, just, I tried to I get i just did it i just did mine so i tried to get real like quiet at the end there i tried to like trail off to try to make you bored so that you wouldn't tell me to use it because I, I i don't know what it is i just there's something that's so bizarre where like i'll use like microsoft to do with reminders I'll use like reminders. It's just there even doesn't even need to be to do. It could be anything with reminders and it'll like help me. Like I'll get so so much more done. I'll be like, wow, that was a great productive day. I feel great. Next day. Don't use it and don't get don't not productive. (laughs) And I just won't use it. I'll be like, man, back in the day I used that to do app. I used it once. But in my brain, I'm like, man, that was great. It was one day, (laughs) one day. But it's just like this. I'm going to force you to use this. That's that. That's the difference here. It's like no one was forcing you to use the to-do. I'm going to literally message you every day if you don't post something on there. I should make my my weekly growth goal app to or make the weekly growth goal to not use the weekly growth goal app. <laughs> Damn it. You're, I can go you're, in you're, and you're change hindering it. My, you're hindering my personal growth, Mike. I, I'm an admin. I can go in and change that. I have the ability. Oh, edited by administrator, yeah. Um, all right. 
Uh, so I think that's it. That really concludes it. I hope you enjoyed the episode about no code tools and how they relate to coding tools and all that cool stuff. If you want to support the show and more episodes like this and more episodes about a bunch of other coding stuff, we are on Patreon. That's patreon.com slash HTML, all the things. Check out the tiers and give that a go. And many thanks to our $3 tier patrons, Sean from RabbitWorks JavaScript at youtube.com slash RabbitWorks JavaScript, Garrick from Local Path Computing and Web Design on localpathcomputing.com, Ryan Gatchel from Blue Black Digital on blueblackdigital.com, Chris from Selfmade Web Designer on selfmadewebdesigner.com, Tim from The Web Hacker on thewebhacker.com, DL Ford from dlford.io, Bim Hashdash from Nine Block Media on NineBlockMedia.com. Jason from Geek Life Radio on GeekLifeRadio.com. And Michael Curie from MC Web Studio via MCWebStudio.ca. Feel free to leave a comment or a review on the platform that you are listening to this on. And this outro will sign us off. You've been listening to HTML All The Things Podcast. Web development, web design, and small business. We hope you've gotten some useful and practical information from this show. And we hope you appreciate that we talk to you like human beings. And we hope you had some fun. We'll be back soon. But in the meantime, hit us up on social media. On Facebook, Instagram, and Patreon at HTML All The Things. And on Twitter at HTML Everything. Until next time, this is HTML All The Things. Signing off.